All right, so on the island of Great Britain, uh, west of England, there's this country called Wales, and uh, there you will find a village and a community called Bedgellert. Now, Bedgellert means the grave of Gellert, and Gellert is a dog. Now, the story is told that Llewellyn, the great prince and lord of Wales, came home one night, and he went to the bedside of his, his little infant son to check in on his son. And when he got there, his son was missing. But not only was his son missing, but there was blood all over his son's bed. And so he began to look around to see what in the world happened, what's going on. And he looks and he sees his dog, Gellert, lying down on the ground asleep. And Gellert has blood all over his mouth. He has blood all over his fur. And in a fury, Llewellyn takes his sword out and he goes over to Gellert and he stabs Gellert with the sword, pierces him through the heart, and Gellert dies. After he does this, he gets up and he goes into the next room and he is shocked by what he sees. We're in a series called Kingdom Come. And as we explore the word together this month and next month on our way to summer, I mean, if you can believe it, we're almost at summertime. So as we head into summer, we want to look at New Testament testimonies of triumph. All right, so, so, so how did we arrive here? How did we arrive here? Thanks for asking, let me tell you. All right. We spent much of last fall preaching about honey in the rock in response to a third instance of honeybees getting into the walls of our Bonita building and creating a beehive. Now, this is something that happened in 1997 when Pastor Francis established the Rock of Roseville. It happened again about 10 years ago when a prophetic evangelist named Sean Smith came here, and as he was ministering, he said to the church, there's still honey in the rock. And literally, as he was saying that, there were honey bees creating a hive in the walls of our Bonita building. And then this happened last summer. This happened last summer. And when it happened last summer, we took it as a prophetic sign that what God has had in his heart for this ministry from the beginning, and what he reminded us of a decade ago, he still intends to do right. here. Amen. Amen. And so as we were getting to the end of last year, Ann and I were talking about what we felt like the Lord, uh, you know, wanted to do in this church in 2024. And we both got a strong sense uh, that we just needed to be intentional about stewarding God's presence. Amen. Um, and, and I love uh, the picture that God gave Aaron on this um, because it's, it's really popular uh, in our culture, in the Christian circles, mostly the charismatic circles, to talk about the presence of God and what it takes to experience it communally. Uh, and a popular phrase um, that has been floating around is this idea of becoming a runway for God to land on. Have you guys heard that at all? Yeah. Right, that we, that we want to become a runway for God to land on. Now, now that's cute, all right, it's cute, but we desire more than that. And so uh, as Aaron and I were just praying about, okay, God, what are you doing here? God gave him something that extended that. He said, no, no I don't want to become a runway. I want you to build a greenhouse. Guys, we don't want God to just land and go. We want him to stay. We want him to dwell here among us, amen? And so that's what we're setting our hearts to do. Now, here's the deal. The deal with that is that when you make room for God to dwell richly in you, the natural result of that is external manifestation, right? And Aaron and I, we were seeing signs of this, but I believe the moment that, uh, that everyone began to take notice was in February at our baptism service. Who's, raise your hand if you're here at our baptism service. Okay, so if you weren't, if you weren't here at our baptism service, we had a service um, where three people, three people signed up to get baptized. I was not prepared, okay? I just came in like jeans, multiple shirts, some boots. Three people were gonna get baptized that day. By the end of the service, we, we baptized 18 people. Uh, some of which, and then, and then, some of which actually received the Lord Jesus Christ as their savior right then and there in front of all of us. And it was amazing service. It was amazing service, all right? There's been other touch points uh, since then, uh, but I just wanna fast forward. The week after Easter, um, we took a group of guys to a mountain 
Um, and the idea was that we wanted to take them to a mountain to just hear the voice of God. Um, and this was something that I had experienced myself. And so I thought that it would be helpful. I, I thought that um, it, would, it would make an impact in our lives. It would move the ball forward. I thought that it would just kind of give the guys a shot in the arm. I had no idea what God was going to do. And let me just tell you guys, these guys came back on fire. I mean, on fire. I'm in the chat. All right, they still have a chat that's going on. These brothers are chatting from 5 in the morning to like 10 at night. All right, I mean, they are encouraging each other, confessing sin, talking through things, all the different things that are going on. We just had a prayer night last night that was beautiful. I mean, they are on fire. This is what's happening. All right. And I actually had to, I actually had to repent for my lack of faith. Because when I came home, I had to face the Lord on this. And I was like, God, I didn't see this coming. And it was a really humbling moment having this conversation with God. And this is what um, I feel like God has been telling me about the moment we're in. That God is bringing New Testament normalcy to this house. Okay. All right. Now listen, God is not just building this church. He's building his kingdom. Okay. He's building his kingdom. Right. And so here's our invitation. Here's our invitation is that if we build God's kingdom, we will get a church thrown in. OK, but to Dr. John's point last week, if we only want to build a church, if we only want the institution, we may get some kingdom. OK, and so what I want to do today is I want to talk about the implications of revival. All right. I want to talk about the internal spiritual dynamic that creates and sustains New Testament normalcy. So, so we often pray, uh, you know, that the prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And maybe when you pray that, you pray that with an end times future glory sense, right? But if you read the New Testament, you will see that the people of God are experiencing the kingdom now. Amen. They're experiencing the kingdom now. And so through this experience at our church, um, I've become fascinated by the ways in which the Holy Spirit in a church community. I, I've, I've become particularly interested in the mechanics of revival. And here's the question I've been asking myself. What are the needed attitudes and actions that make for a church that the Holy Spirit would be happy and pleased to visit and display his power through? That's the question I've been asking myself. And so this led me to the book of Acts, the day at Pentecost, where the first revival ever broke out. And so some of us are aware of revivals that have happened historically uh, throughout church history. A few revivals are in scripture, but others like the Protestant uh, Reformation, the, the first Great Awakening, the second Great Awakening, Azusa Street Revival, and many others. Um, what, I, what I have seen when I'm studying these revivals is that historic revivals have a pattern to them. All right. They have a pattern. There are common characteristics that people of God can be revived. And so here are, here are four characteristics that I see as I'm studying revival. Here are four things that I see that, that lead to the people of God being revived. The first thing we see is that the church typically, typically have, the church faces a major obstacle or problem. All right, so may it be persecution, or opposition, or uh, even at times spiritual decay, right? You see this in Acts chapter four, the religious leaders, they release the, the disciples out of prison and then they threaten them as they release them. Um, you see the, even in the Korean revival that uh, much of what led to the Korean revival was the Japanese oppression, right? On and on and on, you see this uh, throughout historic revivals. So the church faces a major obstacle problem. Number two, um, a consider, a, a Concerted effort and extraordinary seeking of God in prayer happens uh, by the people of God. Concerted effort, extraordinary seeking God of God in prayer. Third thing that happens is a visitation. All right. God's royal presence comes down. His presence is undeniable. His truth shines in the hearts of his people. And then fourth, the fourth thing that happens is a transformed community emerges. All right. The people of God are restored to New Testament normalcy. All right, and so as I've been studying revival, I've become convinced of this. All right, I've become convinced of this that human community can achieve 
the kind of beauty that a Christian church, which is glorified by a visitation of God's presence, can achieve. I'm either misunderstood or I'm preaching good, so let me say this again. All right. No other human community can achieve the kind of beauty that a Christian church, which is glorified by a visitation of God's presence, can achieve. All right. And so Acts chapter 2 gives us the account of the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes and fills the disciples. Uh, the external manifestation of this feeling was that their miraculous ability to speak, uh, it was their, the miraculous ability to speak in other tongues, which was convenient because in that very time, there were many God-fearing Jews from every nation that were visiting the area, and they were drawn to the spectacle. And so Peter steps forward to preach a sermon, and the response to P Peter's sermon is every preacher's dream, All right? Every preacher's dream. Thousands convert, okay? Thousands convert. Now, I've read Peter's sermon plenty of times. Um, you know, Peter quotes the book of Joel. He quotes the book of Psalms. He uh, doesn't just declare Jesus, but he proves Jesus, right? He makes it personal, or he says to them, God made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ, right? And so the sermon's fine. It's fine. It's okay. The sermon's okay. All right. From everything we know about Peter to this point, he's not a polished speaker, right? He's not an eloquent guy at all. We have no reason to believe, you know, that, that he's this like great orator and has the ability to command a crowd the way that he does in this moment. And so the question that I ask as I read this, as I read his sermon in Acts chapter two is, why was it so impactful? Why was it so impactful? Um, oh. <laughs> so I'm gonna give you another chance. All right. God's work can only change you once you're convinced that it concerns you. <laughs> I'm so done with you guys. I'm, we're going to go on vacation again. We're just leaving. Uh, going to move on. So the only way that you can actually become a Christian is when God becomes personal. All right. All right. The very thing that led to my conversion uh, is when I responded to an altar call. And as I was walking forward, I heard the inward audible voice of God. All right. I didn't hear it. Was, it wasn't, I, I heard it on the inside. It was odd to me, but God said, you've been looking for a father your whole life. I'm the one you're looking for. I could have never said that to myself. I, I, I just couldn't have thought that thought, right? God became personal. He became personal, right? And so to this crowd, Peter says, this Jesus that you crucified, right, is both Lord and Christ, right? And so they were cut by the reality of their sin before God. They were cut by the reality of their sin before God. Do you feel that? Do you feel that? You know the Holy Spirit has cut you when you see yourself as the one who crucified Jesus, right? And so before you were cut to the heart, you may have been weighed down by the guilt of your sins. You may understand that you have broken God's rules, but when you're cut to the heart, you begin to understand, no, I have broken God's heart. See, it's one thing to understand that you've broken God's rules, but it's another thing entirely to understand that you have broken God's heart. A, a religious person sins and says to themselves, I've broken God's rules. But a person that has been cut to the heart, when they sin, they say, no, 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 I have broken him. Okay? And so to finish the story that I started with, Llewellyn, the, the prince and lord of Wales, he sees his son is missing, he sees his dog Gellert with blood all over his mouth and fur. And he pierces his dog through the heart with his sword. And then he walks into the next room to see his young child perfectly unscathed and a huge wolf lying dead. And suddenly Llewellyn realizes that the blood on the sheets was his dog Gellert's blood. That the blood all over his mouth and all over his fur was the wolf's blood and Gellert's blood. 
And so it dawns on Llewellyn in that moment that he had slain the savior of his family because he didn't know what he had done. Guys, this is what it means to become a Christian. A Christian is someone who says, God, I had no idea what you have done, and I've been treating you like an enemy. That's what a Christian is. Zechariah 12.10 says this. It says, they will look upon the one they have pierced, and they will mourn as for an only son. Right? Llewellyn killed his family's savior. And a person who's been cut to the heart understands that they've done the same thing. A person who's been cut to the heart finds themselves being pierced by the one they've pierced. And so now being cut to the heart is the work of the Holy Spirit, but you and I have to respond. All right, we have to respond. And as you read through the book of Acts, you actually see another instance where people are cut to the heart. In Acts chapter seven, Stephen preaches to the Sanhedrin and they were also cut to the heart, the Bible says, but then it says that the Sanhedrin gnashed their teeth they covered their ears, they yelled out loud so they couldn't hear, and they went and they dragged him out of the city and they stoned him. And so you and I get to choose how we respond to the cutting. We get to choose. In Peter's case, the people ask, what shall we do? And Peter says this to them. He says, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you want to be part of a transformed community, um, if uh, we truly want revival and we desire to be a people who are restored to New Testament normalcy, the Holy Spirit needs to cut you, but you also need to repent and receive forgiveness, amen? You need to repent and you need to receive forgiveness. I just want to define these because these are two words that get confused in our culture. I want to define these, and then when I'm done, I'm going to invite a few friends to come up and show us what this looks like and how it works itself out in our lives. Amen? Amen. So first, forgiveness. All right, forgiveness is the heart of the Christian message. All right, it's the heart of the Christian message. But you, bet, but you are better prepared to understand forgiveness and desire it when you understand sin. Now, remember what I said. I said they were cut by the reality of their sin before God. See, to sin means to miss the mark, right? And that's a good definition of sin because the only way that you can miss the mark is if you have a target that you're aiming at, right? right? God has given us his written word, and he's also written a moral code on our hearts. And so anything you say, anything you do, anything you think that violates this code is a sin. And so sin then sets up strange and fractures in your life that lead to breakdown. Sin dominates, it devastates, it separates. And although your sins may be against someone else or against yourself, your sin is first against God. Amen. Uh, another thing about sin is that sin is costly, right? God literally says that sin will cost you your life. Uh, the Bible says this, it says, without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. Right. There's, there's no remission of sins. Uh, and so sin always incurs a debt. All right, let me explain it to you this way. Um, if I were to come over to your house, and, um, and you let me in your house, of course. So you let me in your house, and we're hanging out, and you have a, a laptop on your kitchen table. And I walk over to your kitchen table, and I bump it, and the laptop falls and crashes and breaks. There's two ways to respond to that. All right, well, there's probably more, actually. But two main ways to respond. Okay, one way is you're paying for that, which is warranted, by the way, all right? The other way to respond is, hey man, don't worry about it, no big deal, I forgive you. Now, if you forgive me, does that all of a sudden repair and replace your laptop? No, if you say I forgive you and I walk out of the door, now you take on the burden and the debt of replacing your, your laptop, amen? That's how it works, right? And so sin is costly, but so is forgiveness, right? Forgiveness pays the debt. It's important to understand that. That what God is offering you is not just some sugar daddy thing, right? Like this is a really important thing to give. It costs him something to say you're forgiven, amen? And so God is loving enough 
to desire reconciliation with you. And he's at the same time wise enough and powerful enough to make a way to do so without compromising his holiness. The way he does this is through forgiveness. Amen. And so receiving forgiveness from God drains your heart of the guilt and the shame and the slavery and the partnership with sin. To forgive you costed the life of God's son. God gave up his son to gain you, and that's really where the power to change comes from. Amen? That's where it comes from. That to get forgiveness from God means that you also get a restored relationship with God. And that's really what you want, fam. That's really what you want, right? In all your seeking and all your insatiable um, uh, need for approval from other people, and all of your overworking and driving yourself into the ground, and all of your you know, uh, late night searches in your laptop, and all of your hookups, and all of your one night stands, and all of your Amazon.com shopping addictions. All right, don't make me come get you. You know what your vice is. Right, and all of your seeking, and all of your striving, and all of your searching, and all of your longings, the only thing that is going to repair and empower you is the forgiveness that God alone offers you in Jesus Christ. It's the only thing, right? And you can't buy this thing. You can't hustle for this thing. You can't earn this thing. It can only be received. It can only be received, right? And so forgiveness is one part of this. The second part is repentance. Now, I've learned a great way to talk about repentance. Uh, Tim Keller wrote a book called Forgiveness, um, and he asked this question in it. He says, what if I told you that no matter how much you've blown up your life, there was a way to get through it? Think about that question. What if I told you that no matter how much you've blown up your life, there was a way to get through it? The way through it is what the Bible calls repentance. And in all my years of walking with Jesus and, and dealing with this personally along with ministering to others who have dealt with it, I've learned that repentance is really tricky, right? It's tricky, right? The reason why repentance is tricky is because it is as much heart as it is action. Okay, follow me on this. It is as much heart as it is action. And you can do the action without the heart. And in doing so, you can deceive yourself and deceive others. Now, please do me a favor. I'm almost done here. I, I'm going in teaching mode here, but this is important. Because I believe this right here is the reason why so much devastation happens to the people of God. We don't understand when we've repented, and we don't understand when people in our lives have repented. And it hurts us, all right? And so if you want to truly repent, you have to stop doing three things. You have to start doing two things, all right? You have to stop doing three things. You have to start doing two things. So first, I want to give you the things that repentance is not. So repentance is not blame shifting, all right? Repentance is not blame shifting. Real repentance takes responsibility for sin. Blame shifting shifts the responsibility. It, it justifies sin, right? Blame shifting says things like this. I'm sorry, but really it wasn't my fault, right? Blame shifting says, I shouldn't have done that, but you provoked me, right? And so the language of a repentant heart is, I've been mistreated, right? I've been trouble. I have troubles, but I did not react to these conditions as I should have. It is my own sin that has led to my misery, and for that I take responsibility. All right. That's what repentance looks like. All right. And so repentance is not blame shifting. Repentance is not self-pity. Right. It's not self-pity. A false repentance is sorrow over the consequences of the sin and the trouble that it has caused you. Yeah. Hear that. Yeah. False repentance is sorrow over the consequences of the sin and the trouble it's caused you. Real repentance involves grief over the sin itself and what it has done to others and to God, right? So it is possible to feel really bad when you do something wrong, okay? It's possible to feel really bad for how your sins are negatively impacting you and out of self-preservation, you make changes. This is happening all the time. People will feel sorrow for their sin, but they don't understand that the sorrow is self-centered. Right. Right. But if it's not true repentance, when the discomfort lifts, 
so will your new actions. Let me just give a quick example to this. Um, Amy and I, for years, we, um, we like cut our teeth on marriage ministry. It's really where we kind of came into our own as pastors. Well, she would never call herself a pastor, but next time you see Amy, say it. Pastor Amy. Okay. I shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry. I love you. I love you. I was, feel, I, I was feeling a little testy. I don't know why I did that. Um, so early on, we were um, serving in marriage ministry, and we would come across couples that we would spend some time with, and we would serve, and um, and we would we, like this just kind of happened a lot where you'd see one that was fed up, right? Just fed up, was ready to walk away from the marriage because of what the other spouse was doing. And then the other spouse would finally kind of come to and say, please, please, please don't leave. Please, I'll do anything. I'll do anything. And all the changes that person would make would be amazing. We'd be like, oh, man, look, like, he's really changed. Like, I think God's really doing something, blah, blah, blah. And then as soon as all her pressure would let up, he would chill out, and we'd be in the same situation over again. All right? That's false repentance. Sometimes you just feel bad because your sins are making your life miserable, right? And so repentance is not blame shifting. It's not self-pity. Lastly, repentance is not self-flagellation. It's not self-flagellation. Self-flagellation is inflicting personal punishment on yourself so that no one else can. It tries to pressure others and even God not to accuse, but to excuse, right? The logic goes like this. It goes like this. If I beat myself up enough, surely this will atone for my sin and no one will ask anything else of me. The problem with this is that by trying to atone for your own sin, you are rejecting the only thing that can actually heal you, which is the forgiveness that God alone offers you. Okay, that's the problem, right? And so to repent means to stop blame shifting, to stop reveling in self-pity and to stop the self-flagellation but also means you have to start doing two things, all right? Proverbs 28, 13 says this. It says, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy, all right? And so to truly repent, we must do two things. We must confess and we must forsake, all right? And so when it comes to confession, to confess means to make a full, clean admission of what you have done wrong without qualification or excuse, without minimizing or relativizing, all right? The, the word translated confess, or one of the words translated confess in scripture has this sense of praising and thanking God in it, which is to say that true confession honors and glorifies God, and that is why it's such a powerful act. It literally ushers in the presence of God. Confession is that powerful. It ushers in the presence of God. Right? The Bible says this. It says, if you confess your sins, what? He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Confession ushers in God's presence. But not only is it enough to confess, right? You also need to forsake, right? Because saying that you have a problem is a very powerful thing, right? That's a powerful thing. But it's not repentance until you have built new structures and rhythms around saying no to future partnership with that action or desire. Right. It's not repentance until you do that. All right. To repent is to agree with God about your sin and to turn away from that sin and walk with God to pursue what he has for you. Amen? Amen. You've got to confess and forsake. All right. And so to be cut to the heart means that the truth and the beauty of the gospel has finally come home to you as expressed through your ability to receive forgiveness and repent. Amen? Uh, the crowd asked Peter and his apostles, what shall we do? He preaches his sermon. He's done. It says they're cut to the heart. And they say, what shall we do? In other words, what they were saying is, we will do whatever you tell us to do. We'll do whatever. And so you will know that you have received God's forgiveness and you're walking in repentance when you take all conditions off of your obedience to God. You will know you will know that you're walking in God's forgiveness and in repentance when you take all conditions off your obedience to God. And so I want you to see what this looks like in, in real life. And so at this time, I'm going to invite my friends, Aaron and Rochelle, to come forward and share their story. Give them a hand as they come up. Amen.
to pray for us real quick before we share this story. <clears throat> Father, we just invite you here today. I thank you for a spirit of repentance in this church. I thank you for a spirit of transparency. I thank you for a spirit of surrender. I pray that our story will touch marriages, will touch lives. I pray that your will will be done in Jesus' name. So we're up here to unveil a nearly 20-year marriage for you. <clears throat> Not to um, incur judgment, air our dirty laundry, but really for the sake that you would see the glory and the faithfulness of God through it. Yeah. Rochelle's going to start with her story. We'll kind of go back and forth. Uh, okay. I do not like this. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay. This is kind of like PG-13, kind of. Yeah, if you have kids so, in here, you might like, send them out. Yeah, <laughs> you might want to. Okay. When I was growing up in a southern church, I'm Baptist, well, I was Baptist, uh, we had a saying which was, or is, God is good. So when I say, and all the time... You guys know it. Okay, so keep that in mind as you hear our testimony. Just one second. I see some parents taking their kids out. <laughs> one more. Okay. When I was six years old, I was raped by my mother's love and boyfriend. And for a decade after that, I was sexually molested by him. They later went on to marry. Um, I just had to live with that growing up. And so I just internalized it um, as I got older. And then I met Aaron. And I just left that life behind. I didn't go by my first name. Rochelle is not where my hands would uh, split and bleed, split and bleed, and um, that's why a lot of times when people try to, and then, so that's what I, what, that's what I kind of brought into the, the marriage. I was just broken. So that's a little bit about what she brought. Um, I'm going to talk about what I brought. So you can have... There's a lot of different relationships you can have with the spirit of lust. For me, um, something happened to me in second grade that caused me to believe that my pathway into connection and relationships was by creating lust in other people. So I fed my value that way for a long time. In high school, I met a girl who was addicted to lust, addicted to sex, and I went about <clears throat> creating situations and ways to, to, to stir that up and to feed that in order to gain my value. And we married, and after about a year when I was deployed in the military, she found other objects for her lust which crushed my identity, and I tried to take my life at that time. When I got out of the hospital, I went about trying to recreate my identity in the same ways I had by creating relationships with people and stirring lust and feeding that lust. Um, somewhere in there, I met Rochelle. Uh, we fell in love quickly. We got married quickly. Um, but there was which progressed. Um, the things she talked about, the bitterness, the anger, the OCD, the resentment, continued to escalate, and our marriage continued to disintegrate. Um, in 2015, I met Christ, and my life really began to transform. But the one thing I was unwilling to do was to let go of my secrets. I came to a place of repentance. I came to a place of surrender. But still, my secrets existed. So as her problems continued to escalate, I decided that I was going to address it in the spirit. I was going to take it to prayer. I was going to stand in faith. For the next six or seven years, I did that. 
I prayed hours a day for her. I prayed for our marriage. I stood in faith that everything would turn around. I didn't take into consideration 1 Peter 3, 7. That essentially says that if you're not honoring your wife, your prayers are hindered, right? <clears throat> That's not honoring your wife when you're keeping secrets. So at the end of, what, 2021, um, we separated as he began exposing my secrets. He began giving her dreams of everything I'd ever done, <laughs> of everything I was doing now. And she wants to, we don't have time to go through all those dreams, but she wants to highlight a couple of those and kind of where that took her. It was brutal. I saw things he did in his past when we weren't together, um, things he did while we were separated. Um, but God is good. Oh, yeah. OK, <laughs> there's a reason. Um, so one. I've had, I have had so many, um, so one, I've had, I have had so many dreams for the, like the past two years, but one was, one that I want to highlight, um, in the dream, uh, we are at a Christmas party, and Aaron is just dancing around, and I'm like, why is he, why is he dancing, like, he was just dancing like a fool, I felt like, in the spirit, and um, he comes up to me, and he turns around, and the back of his head has a huge cut going down, and it's open, and there's blood and membrane and tissue, and I cover him. Thank you. Thank you. And I cover him. And then I lay down on the floor and I look out the window and right next to me, there's a man who just laid by me and was calm. And it was Jesus. And he was basically letting me know that I have to protect him even though we're separated, even though we're divorcing. And he will cover me. So the way I learned to cover him was, I prayed harder than I ever have for anybody. I prayed from the spirit, from with my soul. I could literally see my spirit bent over and just, praying. I broke off soul ties with him because he was already in another relationship, but I broke off soul ties that he created that he didn't know. God taught me how to be a warrior for Aaron and for myself. Another way God protected me was during all this time, my life didn't really change financially. My mortgage was paid. He didn't live with us. My bills are paid. I don't have a job. I haven't had a job. I'm a stay-at-home mom. He made sure all the bills were paid. He would come over three times a week and cook for the girls, me and the girls, and just make sure that we were good. Another way God was blessing me um, was people at the church. I think Cody's gone, and so is Patty. But Cody, um, I ran into him two times, and he just walked in boldness and wanted to pray for me and just spoke life into my heart. Patty did the same thing. It seemed like pretty much everyone I encountered was just smiling at me and telling me I was light and was just blessing me. I've, God, he covered me completely. He covered Aaron, he covered me. But then, so my father, my actual, my birth father, my biological father, who I look like, I have a twin sister, but um, I could be, we could be triplets. I didn't grow up with him at all. And he started calling me every day, praying for me every day. Um, praying for me every day, uh, and then we just developed a, a, a beautiful relationship, and God restored that, and it's just, it's amazing. Um, one other way God covered me, um, and it was pretty much giving me an idea of what the future was going to be like, is um, my twin sister, she has a gifting, which I didn't think I had. Um, she can see people's, like, the future and 
and I never really talked to her about it, but she said, one day she's looking at me and she's like, girl, you're gonna meet a man? And she's like, he's six two, dark brown hair, built. She's like, girl, he's a doctor, he's got it going on. And at this time, I'm like, well, I'm not interested in any of that stuff. I'm not interested in dating. I don't care what he looks like. I'm not interested. So Aaron, for 20 years, had blonde hair. What is this? Dark brown, curly hair, 6'2", built. <laughs> doctor. He has his doctorate in psychology. But I didn't know that at the time. God was trying to tell me, like through my sister, I've got you. There's going to be reconciliation. So this is your turn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good job, baby. Thank you. Um, so a theme that continued to show up throughout her dreams is um, a theme of Christmas time. Now, Rochelle always said that even though we were separated, divorced, that um, she wanted to spend the holidays together. So this last Christmas, we were together as a family. And in the middle of my darkness, it felt like God sent in an angel of light to me. He unveiled my eyes and I could see the transformation in Rochelle. I could see all the differences in her. And I, we started having feelings for each other again and we reconnected and we didn't know what to do with it. I was on another living situation. She had her stuff going on. We couldn't see a way forward. Fast forward to New Year's, I was out doing the same things I always did. But the only thing I could think about was that angel of light was being back with her. So I decided I was going to go home. And I, I went home, I took her out on a date. And there was a new beauty to her. She's already gorgeous, right? But there was a, there was a joy, there was a peace, there was a presence of God on her and I began to fall in love with her again. That night, this was all God, we came down with COVID and we spent the next eight days locked up together, <laughs> talking through everything. And at the end of those eight days, the, the only conclusion we could come to is that we don't have the strength to put anything back together, but we know God is in this and God's will be done. So I wish I could say that it was all roses and fairy tales at that point. But the truth is, when we came back together, I came in with all of my stuff still. I came in looking for validation in the same ways I was getting it from, from other people. The problem is, Rochelle's not a lustful person at all. She saw something deeper in me, something that I couldn't see that she loved. And I started putting pressure on her to validate the parts of me that shouldn't have been validated. And also, I came in with a whole new box of things that she could be resentful about. So we had a lot of work to do, right? Yeah. <laughs> but here's the conclusion that we came to. We came to the conclusion that there's three things that really have to be in place. The first one is transparency. I didn't want to be transparent. I didn't want to tell my secrets. God forced it on me. And he still forced it on me even after we were back together. <laughs> I have to, uh, God shows me everything for him. So two weeks before he went to a concert, I, God showed me that um, a, a woman with um, blonde hair and green eyes uh, would come up to him she would be with a, a man with dark brown hair. In the dream, she, um, she touched his arm. And we, Aaron and I are walking up into the courthouse and um, courthouse judgment. And um, I think I write down dissuade. dissuade. You will dissuade. You will dissuade. So then Aaron, you can tell this part of the story. <laughs> this is my dream, by the way. This hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. So just like her dream, I go to the concert. There's a woman with blonde hair and green eyes. I go with a friend who has brown hair. She befriends my friend and asks him to introduce her to me. And w but this time when she reaches out to touch my arm, I pull back 
and I tell her that I'm with someone and I dissuaded. <laughs> so God continues to move in transparency. This, the next thing that had to be in place was repentance. So when I first came out of this, when I first came back with Rochelle and she wasn't validating the things that I thought were valuable, I wanted nothing more than to just get back to the stage, get back to my old life and get back to being validated. But I began asking God for the gift of repentance. It wasn't until Rochelle prayed over me that I would find my validation in him, that I suddenly the next morning I woke up, I felt the weight of my sins. I felt the weight of them. I felt the weight of the sin I had caused in other people. And then God wiped it away and he restored my identity and he reintegrated me. And suddenly I felt valuable, not for those things. I could see the things that she was loving. And I became a whole man again. And I became a man that was capable of being loved and a man that was capable of loving her the way that she needed to be loved. And the final thing that had to be in place was surrender. In order to stay in this place, I have to continue to do the work. She has to continue to do the work. We're reading a book on bitterness. I'm going to SA groups. I'm going to therapy, we're going to couples therapy. We're doing the work, but it has to come from a place of surrender. So I'll let you, oh, do you have that picture of the horse by chance? Did, did you ever get that? So this is a picture, <laughs> this is a picture that's hanging in our living room. It's pretty big. Um, when I, when we bought it, I just thought it represented my past and that's why the horse's head is down and it's called the, the bow. Um, now I feel like it represents us. Uh, you'll see that the part of the mane is missing, part of the tail is missing, but what do you notice? You notice all the muscle. We've been through, we've been torn down, repaired, built up, torn down, repaired, built back up, and now we're left with this muscle. And then I like to think that that white cloth is a shroud of Jesus or God, and he never left us. So we've been through the battle, but he's still there with us. You could summarize your I'm tired of talking, so I'll, I'll let you do it. <laughs> um, so I just want to throw out a couple of challenges. Um, she talked about bitterness and resentment. These things come from a real place of pain. They come from real hurt and they feel justified. The problem is that they exist because of a lack of forgiveness. Because there's no forgiveness, and because this is not a part of God, God is not bitter. Satan is bitter, God is not bitter. So that stuff exists in the kingdom of darkness. So anytime Satan wants to attack you, he's got free reign there. He can stir up that bitterness. He can stir up that resentment. So your marriage is never gonna be in the right place if you're holding on to that hurt. So I wanna challenge those of you that are holding on to bitterness and hurt. I wanna challenge you to let God come in and forgive. For those of you in relationship with lust, I wanna say this. For those of you with secrets, I wanna say this. I know that many of you in this room have secrets from whoever you're with. I know you don't wanna tell them, my heart goes out to you. I didn't want to tell mine. <clears throat> but there cannot be transformation in your marriage without transparency. I know that you're sitting there thinking that you're carrying the burden for that other person because if you told them it would be too painful. I'll tell you they're already carrying that burden and it probably feels heavier to them because they don't know what they're carrying, right? I know that some of you are thinking, <clears throat> if I told them, it would lead to the death of our marriage. But what you're failing to recognize is that your marriage is already dead. I think it's better to have a chance at life in your marriage than to have the assurance of death. 
I don't know if your marriage is going to end or not, if you're honest. But I do know that at least you have the chance of restoration. And I'm living proof that that's possible. So my challenge to you today is to take the first step and to be honest. I didn't know that um, Pastor Sean was going to talk today about revival, but a couple of days ago, when I was thinking about putting our story together, God said to me, he said, this is the beginning of revival. The beginning of revival comes from repentance. If we're going to be a church that experiences revival, we've also got to be a church that's willing to be transparent and willing to repent and willing to surrender. So that's our story. One quick note about them. Yeah, just stay standing. We're going we're gonna to close here. One thing about them that kind of drew my attention to this is, you know, I, I had a chance to kind of watch their relationship fall apart. Um, had a conversation with Aaron, gosh, a year and a half ago, probably. Um, had a conversation with Rochelle, probably six, eight months ago, and was just trying to love on them, encourage them. Um, and knew that they weren't together. And then all of a sudden, a couple months ago, you know, I'm here in church and I see those two together. I'm like, huh, they're together, weird. <laughs> and then another week goes by and they're like holding hands. I'm like, huh, weird. <laughs> another week goes by and he's like got his arm around. Her. I'm like, huh, weird. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I just want you guys to know that, um, you know, this is a, what I love about them is that this is not polished, right? This is still in progress. There's still many things that God is doing in them, but we know the miracle that's happening here. So here's what I want to say. Amen. Amen. We're going to close. Listen to this. The blade of the gospel is not a blade of a thief that cuts to hurt. It's the blade of a Holy Spirit surgeon that cuts to heal. Yeah. Right. And so if you were feeling cut to the heart today, the reason why you're feeling that feeling is because it is a personal invitation from the God of heaven to his kingdom come. But you have to allow yourself to be pierced by the one you've pierced. That's what you have to do. See, New Testament normalcy can only happen when you take all conditions off your obedience to God and receive his forgiveness, knowing that in Jesus Christ, all your debts have been paid. Amen. New Testament normalcy happens when you can confess and forsake your sin and repentance with the assurance that that's going to usher in God's presence to heal you and empower you. And so if you're here today, you would say, Sean, I know I need Jesus. There's a, a matter of things that we've talked about today. You know you need to repent. You know you need forgiveness. Maybe you're sitting here and you've been cut to the heart as God's word has been preached. You know that God is moving upon you and you want to make a decision. If you're here today with all eyes closed, all heads bowed, I just want to, I feel like we'd be remiss to not give you an opportunity. If you're here and you would say, Sean, I need Jesus, just slip up your hand and we want to pray for you. Amen. Six, seven hands are up. Anyone else? You say, Sean, after the story, the, the testimony that they shared, Sean, I know I have things that I have to work on in my relationship. Slip your hand up. I see you. I see you, brother. I see you. I, I heard this, um, this definition of procrastination recently, um, and it's this, that procrastination is arrogance that God would allow you to do tomorrow what you should do today. And if you're standing here, you know you need to give your life to Jesus. You know you need to repent. You know you need to get right. Maybe you're a believer. You've been walking with Jesus, but you have been white-knuckling your own life. And you think that if you keep control, somehow you keep things together. I'm telling you. 
That's not it. Give Jesus a chance to actually repair you. This is my last call. Just slip your hand up. We want to pray for you. I see you, brother. And so, Lord, I just thank you for the people of God. God, I thank you that you are bringing transparency to this house. That we will be a people who are quick to repent, quick to tell on ourselves, quick to turn ourselves in. And we know how much it hurts to do that, God. But give us a sense of everything that occurs on the other side. Help us to be people who are cut to the heart. Help us to be people who understand that we are like the Lord Llewellyn who pierced the one who saved us. There are people in here who raise their hands because they know they need you. They know they need your presence. They know that they need the forgiveness that only you provide. But I would say there's even people in here who couldn't do it. And so I ask God that you would reach them right now by the power of your spirit that you would reach them right now. God, we thank you for everything that you're doing in the hearts of your people. And we trust you that the thing that you've begun in us, you will complete it. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.